Good morning, Zion. Good morning. Welcome to this second Sunday of Lent. Um, there are actually quite a few announcements this morning, so I wanted to draw your attention to the flowers at the front of the uh, front of the sanctuary here. They are uh, in honor of the of Sherry King and Jim Frederick. Their funerals were this week, uh, and so this week keep them in your prayers. Uh, keep the families in your prayers as you lift up um, the families of Sherry King and Jim Frederick. You'll find in your in your pews today there is actually a little flyer. Um, and they would probably be on the ends of them, but if you haven't seen them, we do have extras. The Lutheran disaster response has identified, obviously, the Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict. And so if you so are so called to give to that particular organization as they try and help the refugees and other individuals who have been displaced, um, take a look at that information, uh, and that's available to you. If you have any questions, please reach out. This week, uh, the Lent uh, services this week are going to be at, again, 1.30 um, and 6 o'clock. So 1.30 and 6 o'clock, mercy in the storm is what we're calling that. And we're going to get into chapter 2 of Jonah. So if you'd like to come to that uh, and you'd like to bring your Bibles, just remember we're going to be looking at the NIV version of that particular story. So if you read the message or if you read the English Standard Version, it's going to be just a little bit different, but not that different. So come as you are able if you feel called. Uh, as far as Compass, our Compass kids are going to be uh, watching, I guess, our contenders and our warriors. Our 6th, 7th, and 8th graders are going to be watching episode 5 of The Chosen. Episode 5 of The Chosen. If you would like to watch that, we invite you to that as well. That will be happening in the fellowship hall. And we are hoping to have a new member Sunday at the end of April. My last count is that we have nine like to become members of Zion Lutheran Church. And so if you would like to, or if you know somebody that would like to become a member of Zion, get the word out there, and we would love to lift them up in celebration at the end of April. Uh, what a joyous occasion. Today, we continue with our sermon series, I Need, as we journey through the book of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah is a short 13-chapter book that's stuck into the middle of the Old Testament, although chronologically it's more toward the end of the Old Testament. Last week we started with chapter 1. This week we are on chapter 4. So obviously we skipped a couple of chapters in between. I invite you to open up your Bible and start reading uh, Nehemiah and the chapters in between. Uh, next week we're going to get into uh, chapter 7. So essentially it's just going to be two chapters a week. And honestly, just as a disclaimer, there are parts of this book uh, that are a scripture reader's absolute worst nightmare. Um, there are entire chapters that are just names. Just names. So the only consolation that I can give you is this, that I tried to skip over those chapters if you are a scripture reader, uh, but if you do happen to be standing up here this Lent, uh, staring at names like Shealtiel and Zerubbabel, do not be intimidated. Okay? Do we even know if I was actually saying those names correctly? No. I mean, even the letter J. The letter J hasn't made it into any alphabet until just about 500 years ago. So we have actually been mispronouncing Jesus our entire lives. It was probably more like Yeshua. Does that change the message? Does that change his word? Absolutely not. So my advice to you is, if you are called to be up here, be so confident that it makes other believe that they've been saying their name wrong their entire lives. Isn't that right, Daniil Burkhart? It's Daniel. Do we even know? Be confident, okay? Does anybody else have any announcements this morning? Very good. Let us stand and come together in confession and forgiveness. In the name of God, who makes a way in the wilderness, walks with us, and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have you mercy on us. And turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. 
assure us again of your love, and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again, and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace between nations, faithfulness in the church, and the healing of creation, let us pray. who seek the light, those who thirst for mercy, and all who long for God, let us pray. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion with the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in the mystery of the cross, you promise everlasting life to the world. Gather all peoples into your arms and shelter us with your mercy, that we may rejoice in the life we share in your Son, Jesus Christ the Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
responsive reading of Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Close in against me to devour my flesh. They are foes and their enemies will stumble. Though an army encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise up against me, my trust will not be shaken. One thing I ask of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to seek God in the temple. For in the day of trouble, God will give me shelter, hide me in the hidden places of the sanctuary, and raise me high upon a rock. Therefore, I will offer sacrifice in the sanctuary, sacrifices of rejoicing. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice, O Lord, when I cry. Have mercy on me and answer me. My heart speaks your message. Seek my face. Your face, O Lord, I will seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not away from your servant in anger. Cast me not away. You have been my helper. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my oppressors. Subject me not to the will of my foes, for they rise up against me, false witnesses breathing violence. This I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We wait for the Lord to be strong. Make it hard and wait for the Lord. A reading from the book of Nehemiah, the fourth chapter. But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem were going forward and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they were very angry and all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. So we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. But Judah said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing and there is too much rubbish so that we are unable to work on the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see anything before we come upon them and kill them and stop the work. When the Jews who lived near them came, they said to us ten times, from all the places where they live, they will come upon us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people according to their families, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. After I looked these things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your kin, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that their plot was known to us and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and body armor. And the leaders posted themselves behind the whole house of Judah, who were building the wall. The burden bearers carried their loads in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and with the other held a weapon. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread out, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Rally to us whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet. Our God will fight for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to
The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow and on the third day, and I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way. Because it is impossible to kill a prophet to be inside, for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. This week, we are not going to go into the gospel lesson, uh, but I just wanted to make mention that this is one of my favorite gospel lessons of all time. This is the part of Luke chapter 13 that we never get to talk about. We always talk about the first half of Luke chapter 13, the healing of the paralytic and the mustard seed and the narrow gate. Uh, and that's too bad that we don't get to move on to the second half. Because the second half of Luke chapter 13 is what my brother and I used to call sassy Jesus. Uh, it is hard not to read this lesson without reading it with just a little bit of attitude. And so when my parents would say, you need to be more like Jesus, or like, what would Jesus do? You know, we would respond with like, okay, flipping tables and making whips and calling people names and being sarcastic. And they're like, no, that is not what we were talking about. Everything other than that part of the Bible. Okay, but we will talk about that eventually, but that is a sermon for another day. So I just wanted to make mention of that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit among us today. Be with us as we dive into your word. Please protect these individuals from what is my opinion and only reveal what is your heavenly word. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So I did, I wanted to start this message today by just saying this. I love you guys. And now you might be thinking that I'm just using that as a convenient icebreaker or a, an illustration to my sermon. And that's in part. But truly, I love you guys. You are my family. You fill my cup. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday mornings, uh, I'm excited about the midweek Lenten services. Just this last Thursday, I was at a choral concert at the high school, and one of the Compass kids just ran up to me and was like, Isaiah, and I was like, hey, and I gave him a big hug. I love you guys. Love is such an important part of what makes us, us. It's what sets us apart from the world. It's God's greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength. And God's second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Love is in the very marrow of our souls. And so why do we mess it up so bad sometimes? Our sermon series this week it begin, it's today, I guess, is with our biggest need, and our biggest need is love. During the course of the season of Lent, we're exploring four different needs that we tell ourselves are important. I need to get richer. I need to do well. I need to be better. I need to be happier. But using last week's discussion, it's important to talk about our truly our, our biggest human need, love. We have a deep at times, overwhelming, lifelong need to be loved. But it's important to ask, are we doing it right? Are we expressing it right? Are we showing it the way that we should? Is knowing that God loves you, being told Jesus loves you, what do you feel when I say that? 
Is that enough? Do you feel comfort? Do you feel the love? Have you ever said to yourself, I don't feel the same way when I hear that as when I feel love for a partner or somebody else? Am I wrong? Is there something wrong with me? So perhaps you've heard this story. A little girl awakens in the middle of the night because there's a thunderstorm and the thunder's crashing and she calls out for her mother. And her mom comes to her bedside and says, Oh, honey, didn't you realize that God was with you the entire time? And the little girl says, Well, yes, mommy, I know that. But sometimes it's nice to just have somebody with me who has skin on. <laughs> How often do we feel like that? How often are we looking for something that we can touch or see or feel? Something with skin on. Raise your hand if you've never felt that way. We cannot deny that we are drawn to the things of this world. We want to be appreciated. We want to be noticed. To have just one other person like the things that we like, or if nothing else, to smile at us in adoration uh, when we really enjoy something and they don't. We want all those things, but we need to be loved. And again, I want to ask you this question. Are we loving each other according to earthly standards or according to God's? Do we show love? receive love? Are, are we expressing love the way God has designed us? The Bible continues to talk about love over and over again. Actually, there's 551 times over the course of the entire Bible that love is mentioned. Love is shown by us or received by us. God continues to speak to his people about how love is supposed to look. Our teaching text this Lenten season, Nehemiah, it exposes our need to be loved. We are getting into the meat of the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah. The first week we started in chapter 1, and now we've made it to chapter 4. And again, I invite you to read the chapters in between. There's usually only a couple. But to bring you up to speed today, Nehemiah left his position of wealth and privilege to travel back to Jerusalem and motivate the people to build the wall, to rebuild the wall. And over the course of his decision to do so and the actual building process starting, he is surrounded by people who believe it should be done this way and others who say, that's cute, but I think it should be done this way. And all the while, his enemies are closing in around them. And they fire those first shots of any battle. Do you know what the first phase of any battle is? Like what happens before the first punch is thrown or before the first sword is drawn or arrow is thrown, arrow is shot? Step one to any conflict is to tear the other person down, to heckle them, to diminish them, to dehumanize them. Defeat their minds. Make them feel isolated. Make them feel weak and lonely and defeated and small. Everything that love is not. These hecklers were saying things like, your wall looks stupid. Like, even a fox could come through that wall. Give up. I've seen better walls at a chain link fence factory. It's all in chapter two, if you want to go back and read that. But here we are in chapter 4, and these hecklers are back. They continue to spit vile at Nehemiah, to heckle them at their plans and their work. And we see them show up in chapter 4 because they were allowed to creep close in chapter 2. How often is that true for us? Who are the hecklers in your own lives? Who are the hecklers when you feel unloved and unwanted? When you feel that way, does it happen overnight? Or is it because we've allowed them to creep close with little unnoticed steps? The feeling of being unwanted, 
that self-doubt, feeling inadequate, being surrounded by this meaningless temporary love. It reminds me of a game that we used to play. Two, two truths and a lie. I don't know if you've ever played that game before. Two truths and a lie, where you have to tell the other person two truths and a lie, and then the other person guesses which one is the lie. So let's play. I got up this morning at 6.30 a.m. I could eat ice cream every single day because I love it that much. And I absolutely love the Iowa State Cyclones. <laughs> One of those is a definite lie. <laughs> and I'll just leave it up to you to guess. We need to be loved. But we allow the hecklers to creep so close that we can hear them, and then they play this game with that need. So let's play it again and see, it if, see if you can relate. I woke up late today and I forgot to pick up a friend. Truth. I was out of sync all day and I felt terrible that I let my friend down. Truth. I'm worthless. False. How often do we play that game with us, with ourselves? Who are the hecklers in your own lives? There are so many people standing against Nehemiah and the Israelites in this story. They were allowed to creep so close to the people of God, and the people of God were tempted to listen, because what if they were right? Did God really have their best interest at heart? Wouldn't it have been better to put their faith in something that they could see, something with skin on? And that is why we continue to struggle. Our need to be loved is so great, so desperate at times, that sometimes we settle for these inferior expressions of love. Love in the moment. Now, I'm not talking about the love that is expressed in our marriage vows or between a loved one or the love for a child. I'm not talking about true, meaningful expressions of love in our life. I'm talking about the love that is quick, fast, and easy. Meaningless, temporary love that we surround ourselves. And so we hang out with the bully even though they are awful to us. Because the thought of having nobody is too much. It's too desperate. We'll hang out with the bully because we're afraid they're the only ones that will be with us. Nehemiah is face to face with the bully. He represented a people who have been so isolated, so lonely, so desperate for so long that it would not have been surprising for them to allow the bully to control them. But that's not love. And that's not what God's example shows us. There is something far bigger, far better for us. And so Nehemiah's response is to come to the Lord in urgency. He places the situation in God's hands and then gets back to work. I think verse 9 is the key verse in the entire book of Nehemiah. So we prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. That's the linchpin to the book of Nehemiah. It's in this verse that we see that the people both prayed and worked. One did not negate the other. And the same is true for us. Love is an action. It's not just a feeling. It is a purposeful walk toward a tangible result. And it takes a willing participant to do love. It is selfless. And that is not in our human nature. It is terrifying. Love is terrifying. To be completely vulnerable before another person, to essentially say, this is me. What do you think? Love can be terrifying. It's no wonder that we struggle sometimes with it. 
We are selfish people, not selfless. And how much of our sin is a result of being self-focused? Do you hear that? How much of our sin is as a result of us focusing on ourselves? All of it? It's no wonder that Jesus was without sin. He came to be selfless. We are in the season of Lent, which leads up to the greatest sacrifice of all time, the greatest act of selflessness. And it was made out of love. To truly love is to put others first. It is to sacrifice self. And by doing so, it allows us to become something more. Jesus tells us there is no greater love than to lay one's life down for their friends. Love requires something more than ourselves. It requires God. And we can access this through prayer. Prayer emboldens our actions. Prayer fuels our faith. It guides our love. Prayer suffocates fear. Love can be terrifying. But guess what? There are 365 times in the Bible where it says, do not fear. 365, one for each day of the year. Each one an opportunity to silence the hecklers of God's love. Silence the fear. Nehemiah's story points directly to the one that would come after. The savior of mankind. It points directly to the battle between fear and love that took place on the cross and the sacrifice that was made there for us. Fear and death have been conquered and the killing blow was love. Fear is real. It drives us to obsess over needing acceptance or needing love from the things around us, needing these meaningless temporary love, to obsess over how many likes you get on a social media post or how many people notice you today or the disappointments that we've surrounded ourselves with, surrounding ourselves with these disappointments. To cry out, I just need to be loved. You are love. You will find love here, sitting in these pews, over coffee at fellowship in the fellowship hall. Love is found here. God's love is stronger than anything that we could be afraid of. And our disappointments with life, it does not dismantle God's love for us. Listening to the hecklers, listening to those disappointments in our life, our fear of being unloved, it does not diminish God's love for us. The advice of Nehemiah in verse 14 is something that we need to remind ourselves again and again. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of isolation. Do not be afraid of your feelings of loneliness or of disappointments. Instead, remember the Lord. Remember that he is greater. Remember that he is stronger. Remember that he is working even when we don't understand. Remember that he will not leave you now. Remember that he loves you. I don't need meaningless temporary love. We need Jesus. Amen. Will you please stand as you are able as we sing the whole, Thy Holy Wings.
as one community in Christ, let us profess our belief in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the Church, the world, and all who are in need. Heavenly Father, you gather the church into a community of mercy and grace. Unify Christians around the globe in efforts to proclaim good news, even in the face of opposition, and to protect those whose lives are imperiled by the gospel. Merciful God, you raise up leaders committed to love and justice. Nurture to those who govern, who govern patience and receive criticism, open to new ideas, and courage to change course when the need for the sake of the common good arises. Merciful God, you hear us when we cry to you. Attend to those expecting a child and console those who have experienced miscarriage. Comfort veterans enduring post-traumatic stress. Shield those endangered by domestic violence. Uphold those who are ill or grieving. We especially pray for Barb, Catherine, Bob, Roy, Terry, Lois, Robert, and Betty. Merciful God, you kindle faith that moves us into action. Guide children and adults preparing for baptism or confirmation. Empower the Compass teachers and leaders, parents and guardians who share their faith with the younger generation. Give us all renewed sense of your love. Merciful God, you welcome us into your heavenly realm. We give thanks for those whose labors on earth are ended and who now rest with you. We especially remember the families of Sherry King and Jim Frederick. On the final day, gather us all in with them in your loving arms. Merciful God, accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of the world in need. For the sake of Jesus Christ, amen. As we share the peace with your neighbor today, I ask that you remain standing as we bring the offering plates forward. Uh, and as we sing our song, Take My Life That I May Be. The peace of Christ be with you always. Absolutely. Please share that peace with your neighbor. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. 
With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please receive the blessing. You are anointed children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, majestic and mighty, bless you this day and always. Amen. Join, let us join together in hymn 1084, God be the love to search and keep me. It'll be in your blue hymnal with one blue. to the verses. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way. Thanks be to God.